Um, the first session we talked about the who, how to identify, and I am really specifically zoning in on kids with learning disabilities. Generally speaking, Christian school teachers, these are the kids that you're going to see in your classroom. The other kids you'll be able to recognize. The kid with an intellectual disability, you'll recognize that pretty much right away. Okay, um, the kid with Down syndrome, uh, any kind of physical malady or vision problem, hearing problems, those, you're going to recognize that. I'm talking about the kids that often when you look at their little faces, they look like a typical child and they're atypical in how they learn or how they show what they know. And so that's the kid, the, that's the kid I'm zoning in on, the, the, the kid with a specific learning disability. It manifests itself most often in reading. You got a little struggling reader, that's a big red flag, okay? It also manifests itself in math. There is a new, I might got my math person in here, Heidi Brogler. Uh, th there is a, a new term for a math, it's kind of a dyslexia of math, essentially. Uh, it's called dyscalculia. When you, have, when you got a kiddo that really has terrible time with operations or with word problems, that kind of a thing, they very well could have dyscalculia. There's also a writing disorder. Sometimes kids got all that, they have all this information up in their little heads and this little brain, and they can't get it from here to here. They don't know how to, it, it's, it's amazing sometimes with these little kiddos, what they have in their brain, and then you're going, you, when you talk to them, they're so intelligent, and they've got it all there, and for whatever reason, it's not coming here and it's not getting onto the paper. And that's usually, that's a, a, uh, another form of dyslexia called dysgraphia, they call it. Uh, so those are the kinds of kids that I'm talking about. Those are the kids that I have the passion for. Uh, they can learn. It's not that they can't learn. It's just that sometimes they learn in alternate ways and ways that don't fit inside, uh, you know, our little uh, educator's box that, you know, makes it so much easier for us when they fit inside the box, doesn't it? Yes, it does. But, you know, uh, I always tell you, know, I was, I'm a mom, I have three kids, and I tell people, I tell young moms, you know, God gave me my three kids because um, he knew what, what my pride needed working on. And my, every single one of them, there's something in my pride that God said, that's got to go. And, uh, you know, I feel that way about teaching. God gives you the students that you need. Every single one of them, even those alternate learners, even those learners that really struggle, they're in your classroom for whatever reason you need them just as much as maybe they need you. Uh, so that's kind of my passion. I'm excited to talk about this today. Um, I have not yet tripped over this cord. <laughs> just waiting for me to do that. I, I, move, I, I cannot stay, I, I, I don't know. Probably as a child, it would have been a, a diagnosed with ADHD. I don't know, but I cannot stay in one spot when I'm talking and uh, I'm, I'm waiting for my, you know, if I, just so you know, if I fall over that cord, I will laugh at myself. So you can laugh at me too. All right. <laughs> Let's uh, get a little perspective here as we begin, first of all. You know, our job as teachers is to teach the students that we have. Not the ones we would like to have. Not the ones we used to have. Those we have right now. All of them. Ouch. I read a little story about a mom Beautiful, beautiful story about a mom. She told a story about what it was like when she first learned that she gave birth to a child with a special need, with a disability. She said, you know, when you're planning a trip to Italy, you know, you meet with a travel agent, you get all the brochures, you get all so excited about what you're going to see in Italy. You're going to see the Leaning Tower of Pisa. You're going to, what else is in Italy? You're going to see maybe the, I don't know, the Colosseum. Is that in Italy? I'm really bad at geography. Uh, you know, uh, uh, whatever. You're going to see all these amazing things in Italy. Vineyards, beauty. Of the, I mean, just the lush, and uh, amazing Italian food. You're going to enjoy all this. You get all this all set up. You get so excited. Get on the plane. And the stewardess said, hey, come on, welcome. We're happy to have you. Get on, you get, and you. You fly, and they land, and they say, welcome to Holland. And you're like, I, I'm supposed to be in Italy. I'm not, I don't know anything about Holland. Holland? What's in 
Holland anyway. And she said, you know, having a kid with a disability is just like that. She said, you plan and you get excited and you prepare and you're thinking of all the wonderful things that your little Johnny or Jenny is going to do and then you give birth and that doctor said, oh, by the way, you landed in Holland. And you're going, wait, what's in Holland? I don't know what Holland is. And then you look around and you see that Holland has windmills. Holland has tulips. Holland is beautiful. And you go, okay. I belong in Holland. I belonged here all the time. It's a beautiful story. And that's kind of how it is with parents that have kids with special needs. You don't expect it. You don't pray for it. God, please give me a child with special needs. No, we don't pray for that. Teachers, we don't pray for that, you know, because it's hard. It is hard. It's hard work. We pray for the easy path, don't we? And often when we pray for that, God says, nope, you need the hard one. <laughs> and I'm not saying uh, that, you know, it's overly difficult teaching these kids, but you know, it's all, we have to adjust our thinking sometimes. And uh, we need to make sure that we're teaching all of our kids, not just the ones that are good. I had a math teacher, I'm not a math person. Sorry for all you who are math people. I struggled with math in high school. Um, and I was in algebra three, trigonometry and all that. And I can't, I'm not one of those that can look at a math problem and go, oh yeah, I got that all figured out. Okay, just not me. Uh, but if you teach me logical, steps to do it, I can do it. I, I, you know, I can follow directions. I'm not, and you know. So, but my math teacher, there was half of our Algebra three class that were geniuses. Seriously, they could look at a problem, figure it all out. And there were half of us that were kind of the dummy dunces over here. She spent all of her time talking to the geniuses and like all these problems that were ridiculous and completely over our heads. And the, the dummy dunces over here, we were going, hey, hello, hi. So we get to the test and we were failing tests because she wasn't teaching us. Uh, she was really zoned in on those who really love math. And I'm here to tell you, you know, we have students. We have all of our students, and we need to be excited, and we need to know uh, that we need to teach all of our students. So what can you do? Well, first of all, in order to teach your students, you kind of need to know them, don't you? I know we're at the beginning of the school year, and some of you have students in your class that you don't quite know yet. You're still getting to know them. You're still getting to kind of sense their needs and their maybe their strengths and their weaknesses. Maybe you've just had a, maybe one or two tests and you're going, okay, I, I'm getting this kid. I get it. I always tell people, man, it's a shame they give teachers kids for only a year because it's, I feel like by the time the year is over, I'm going, oh yeah, I get this kid. And then they're on to the next class, you know. Um, that's kind of how it goes with teaching. But you need to know your students. How do you get to know students, teachers? You get to teach me. What's that? Listen. 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 Spend time with them, talking to them. Watch them interact. Watch them interact. Yes. Find out their interests. Find out their interests. Yes. I think it's important to see the child outside of the classroom. Yes. Involved in something else. Yes, I agree. See, look, get, get them outside the classroom. What are they doing outside the classroom? Good. Anything else? How do you get to know your students? Yes. Home visits, I think that's a great idea, I do. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. When you actually know a student and your student knows that you know them, is there a connection there often? Yes. Yeah. So when I talk, see Johnny and I know that Johnny likes chess, and I say, hey, so who have you played in chess lately? And they're oh, and they go on and on and on. And you're thinking, chess? I'm like, yeah, there are kids that like chess, okay? <laughs> I don't know who they are, but no, just kidding. <laughs> there are kids that like chess. <laughs> Get to know your kids, okay? What happens with kids when they know that you know them? They perform better. perform better. They trust you. They trust you. You need to be aware. You need to be watching, teacher. I said last session, hey, I get it. Christian school teachers are totally maxed out. You are. <laughs> you are doing both. You're doing like four and five people's jobs. I know that. Um, I was a Christian school teacher. I am a Christian school teacher now, just on the university level. You know, cr the Christian <laughs> environment is, you know, we got, we're trying to accomplish the world with this many people. I get it. But you still need to be aware of what's going, cognizant of what your students are doing. You've got to be aware as a teacher. Be watching, looking, seeing. Be sensitive to them. Be sensitive to them. 
Even in the Christian school environment, aren't kids bringing junk? They're carrying junk. You know what? I went to Christian school. I started going to Christian school when I was in sixth grade. Um, I come from a divorced home. I was the only child in the entire Christian school. And I went to a school that was 700 kids. The only one that had a broken home. The only one. And I was carrying a lot of junk because of that. Um, and that was kind of, you know, but nowadays, I mean, it's like turned, isn't it? It's like, it's like oh, you come, oh, you come from a good home? Okay, good. You know, it's, it's so unusual now. Um, it's, it's sad. It's a sad state of our culture, but it's the, uh, it's the truth. Kids are carrying so much nowadays. Be sensitive to them. They're also carrying the, um, uh, ideas about how they learn and how they think about themselves. I mentioned in, last, uh, in the last session that one of the major predictors of success for kids, for students, for, in learning, and I, I'm talking about academically speaking, so this is very psychological and I apologize, but it is. Okay, here it is. The major predictor is what they call self-efficacy, and that is kids believing that they can succeed. When a child believes they can't, they immediately shut down and they don't perform. And we need to be sensitive to that. Some of these kids have been in school for years and they've been the failure. They've been the dumb ones. They've been the ones that never get it. They've been the ostracized ones. And we need to be sensitive to that. Where are they? What are they feeling? You know, as a parent, I rely on teachers to look out for my kids in that regard. You know, Mama Bear, I'm one of those, you mess with my kids, you mess with me, man. And like, I am not pretty. When, I, when Mama Bear comes out, it is not pretty. Um, and it's come out on more than one occasion and I have to go back and like grovel and apologize because, you know. But I want teacher, I'm, I'm interested in them looking out for my kids. I worry about my kids when they're not under my, my wings. I do. Um, and we need you to do that. We need you to be understanding. And, <laughs> teachers, we need you to be willing to change. <sighs> Education for so many years has been one plus one equals two. Let's learn inside the box. <laughs> and, and it's worked. It worked when I was a kid. It worked, kind of. There were kids that got lost in the shuffle. Um, but you know, the times have changed, my friends. <laughs> the kids that are coming and sitting in your classrooms are not the kids that were in my classroom when I was, in, when I was a kid. They are different, aren't they? They are different. Those of you who have been in education for 25 years or more, can you raise your hand? Think about your first year of teaching. Are your students different now than they were 25 years ago? Yeah, no, totally. And there's a lot of environmental things that are kind of feeding into that. Um, and we have, you know, when you went to school 25 years ago, you learned one plus one equals two. Now we have, well, let's figure out why one plus one equals two. And we got to kind of go around the box. And I'm like, one plus one equals two, for heaven's sake. You know, don't make math harder than what it really is. Uh, but we have got to be willing to change and think outside the box sometimes as teachers. And that is how we're going to help each of our students succeed. If there's one thing that you probably are going to take away, I, have, I, I, I am passionate. I teach on the university level. And when I grade, even on the university level, where learning really lies very heavily on the shoulders of the university student, it is their job to learn the material. I teach, and I do. Um, when I get tests back and I grade tests and I have students who are getting Ds and Fs, I am the kind of teacher that I go, I did something wrong. Oh my goodness, I, I, I did something wrong. We did not cover this appropriately. I did not teach this well. I need to go back. I, we need to do something differently here. I will, and I'm teaching four new classes this semester. I have 100 students, and I feel like I'm up over my ears in prep, and I'm looking and going, okay, next time we're gonna be doing that differently. You know, that's, I want my students to succeed. Now, sometimes you can take a horse to water, you can't make them drink, and I, and I have to find the balance in that, you know, because sometimes I'm harder on myself than I need to be. Uh, but every teacher, that should be their heart. We want our kids to succeed. So, do we need to change? <laughs> Did you ever hear this? 
I, I, I love this quote. If you've told a child a thousand times and he still does not understand, then it is not the child who is a slow learner. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> and sometimes, we, don't we get into a rut as teachers? You know, if you've been teaching for a long time, maybe you've been teaching fourth grade for a long time, and you're like, well, it's just, this is just how I do it. And he just needs to get on the train. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you, teacher, you need to stop the train. Okay, maybe go take a different track. <laughs> you need to change sometimes. And you as an if you're an educator and you have a true heart of an educator, you're willing to do that. You're willing to do that. Um, and sometimes we just need to stop the train and go, okay, what can I do differently here? I taught... Um, High school Spanish for a little bit. Senor, muy bien. Hi, <laughs> my friend, my Spanish friend is in the back. Um, and um, I love teaching high school, school Spanish. I absolutely loved it, I did. Um, and I had a little guy, which now, um, he was in 10th grade, and looking back, I believe that he likely was dyslexic. But back at that time, I did not know anything about learning this. I didn't know anything about anything. Especially, it was so out of my understanding. And um, he, this poor child just could not get Spanish. You, I, you know, I, I'm one of those kind of teachers where when I was, we were, we were learning the AR verbs, if you know anything about Spanish, you chop off the end and you go, oh, as, a, amos, an. And I would stand in front of the class and we'd go, oh, a, we'd sing it, man. And we'd get the oh, as, a, amos, a, and we get, we do it all. And this kid just could not get it. I mean, no matter what. So I started tutoring him multiple times a week and I was teaching him one on one how to translate or not, um, uh, conjugate these verbs. This is, I mean, we're talking Spanish, one, I mean, really, he couldn't get it. But I, I, I tried everything to get him to get it. And then finally, he could actually speak the words. He could do it. He did it in his head, but he couldn't do it on paper. And so um, I just had him give, he, he just did oral tests for me. And he passed the class, praise the Lord. Looking back, I would have just said, okay, you don't need to take Spanish, honey. This is not going to work for you. Generally speaking, y'all, if a kid has a reading disability, they should not take a language because it, it's not going to work, okay? If they have a reading disability, it's very likely they're not going to do well in an alternate language, okay? <laughs> just saying. Um, But I take responsibility for my students' learning. It's my job as a teacher. That's what my, the parents are paying me to do. I'm paying you to teach my child. I'm not paying you to teach my child to have me tutor my child for five hours every night. I love that Mrs. Bragler is one of my, um, she, Mrs. Bragler here, she's a math teacher. And that is her mantra. Every year, a teacher in service, she tells me, I, you're paying me to teach your child math. If you're spending hours and hours and hours at home teaching your child math after, she said, there's a problem. Give me a call. And that's a teacher, that's an educator, that's exciting. So the question is then, teacher, do you need to change? Do you need to change your perception about how you deal with these kiddos? Um, so we're gonna, I'm gonna get into strategies. The handout that you have has all the strategies written out for you. Listen, this is not an encyclopedia. This is not exhaustive. The, Google is your best friend. Teachers pay teachers, awesome site. Um, get on to any special education learning. I mean, I'm telling you, this is, this is just, this is literally just the tip of the iceberg, what I'm giving you here today. But maybe this will kind of springboard and you go, oh, I could do that. Oh, that's easy enough. Okay, we could do that. Uh, so this is kind of maybe to kind of whet your appetite, for, if you will. Um, so we're going to talk about some methods and strategies that you can do to, incl uh, to create what I call an inclusive environment. Inclusive inclusion is a big term right now in special education. It's been since 2004 they mandated that we've got to include students to the uh, most extent possible in the general education classroom. If, so if they've got a disability, we've got to try to keep them in the general education classroom as much as possible. That is a big pop word right now in education, inclusion, inclusion, inclusion. So these kids are in, and they're sitting in your classes right now. They may not be a diagnosed, but they're sitting in your classes right now. And so how can you as a teacher create an inclusive environment where they are learning too? Not just your typical students are learning. One thing I love, I love this one, uh, peer-supported reading. If you've got a lot of reading in your class, or maybe you are in the fourth grade-ish, because usually around fourth grade is when reading becomes a problem, because they become more independent, they're supposed to be more independent in their reading at this time. And so then you go, okay, everybody go have silent reading. And your kid with learning disabilities is like, ah. And then he reads like the first sentence, and everybody, you know, he gets nowhere. So why not pair 
do a pair and share kind of a thing. You pair your strong readers with your weaker readers. And then they practice together, rereading things. They ask questions, that kind of a thing. You know, uh, research, ha I'm, I, I love when people say research has proven, or they said, or, but seriously, re the most recent research out there is saying that peer, um, peer tutoring, peer reading, those kinds of things have major success in the classroom, major success. Yes, sir? The only problem that I find with the paired reading, and you probably have a strategy for this. Where are you from? I'm English. Oh, very cool. Welcome to America. Thank you. <laughs> um, so let's say they're in the paired reading, and yep. because, like, let's say you're going through them a group at a time and just seeing mm -hmm. their own case and yep. their progresses, mm -hmm. what is stopping another group that's on the other side of the room just chatting and gossiping? And, and that's where teacher has work. got to be yep. um, classroom control, yep. classroom management, and, and maybe even a behavior management program, a reward token system, you know, that kind of a thing. Or, okay, let's say they're over there chatting because they're fast learners, giving, giving them something a little more challenging to do. Yep. Okay? That's what I would do, okay? Um, and I, I provide for you on there some things that you can teach the kids to do. Uh, now, let me say this. Whenever you do any kind of a tutoring program or a reading program, here, he kind of brought up an interesting topic here. Um, you as the teacher actually have to teach them how to do. So you've got to teach the stronger reader what you're expecting, okay? So maybe having a little powwow. You know, you send everybody out to recess. You keep your strong readers together for a couple minutes, and you say, you know, we're going to do something new in class tomorrow, and I need your help. And this is what I want you to do. And they're like, yeah, this is awesome. And you know, get them on board with you. Don't do it when you're going to assign the assignment in class. Don't do that. Prepare them ahead of time for that. And it really would not take long to do that. Um, just an idea. Um, so let's keep on going. Along with that is what I was talking about, the peer tutoring idea. You pair a student who has already learned the skills that you're going for, maybe the math facts or uh, the borrowing or the um, uh, something in reading, I don't know, anything, any kind of skill you're looking for, and then you pair them up with a student who needs help in that. And this could go in class. You could do this in class, in your fourth grade classroom. You could do this, you could, you know, you're high schoolers, man. Sometimes they, they squander their study halls, don't they? Why not put them to use? And you know what, this is a great service opportunity for them, teaching them to serve the younger. Say, okay, you know what, I need some high schoolers, I need volunteers just to come and tutor, just some math facts or whatever have you. Um, again, research has proven this, this has met with great success. And I say, um, there is something about a peer motivating a child that, you know, you could, I, I don't know how many of your parents, but you know, you could say something and, um, and then until the cows come home and it does not resonate in the little child's brain. And then they come home and they'll say, you know what Tim told me? Blah, 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 blah. I'll be like, I have been saying that for months. <laughs> Whatever it is, that what the peer, however they phrased it, however they said it, it resonated with them and it worked. And sometimes there's just something with that. There's a motivating factor with peers helping each other. It's a great strategy to employ to kind of get that, uh, your, your, your little chillins to uh, move forward. I'm, I, I'm used to having a notebook, but I have no room for a notebook up here because I'm, I'm used to having a clicker. Um, this is, okay, anyway. See, I'm ADHD, I told you. you know, um, kids with learning disabilities often struggle, yeah, struggle with attention. <laughs> Keeping them what I call on task. Um, they, the, you know, you'll be sending everybody, okay, do your little seat work, and here's Johnny. He's in, like, who know what, what cloud he's on. I don't know. Um, they are in another world. And so how do we keep them on task? So what I like to do when I have a little Johnny or a Jenny who struggles with keeping on task or staying with me, I create a cue that only he and I know. It could be me just ringing a little bell. It could be me tapping the desk. It could be me touching his shoulder. It could be me, <clears throat> I don't know. I decided, I get it set up ahead of time with Johnny or Jenny and I say, every time you hear Mrs. Miller or you see Mrs. Miller touch your shoulder, that means that you are off task and you need to figure out what you're supposed to be doing. And cueing for attention, we use those specific cues to help them stay focused. It could be in the middle of your little lecture. 
and you go, <clears throat> and he goes, oh, that's for me. Nobody else knows but you. And it could be, yes, exactly right. That's exactly right. <laughs> but um, I um, create my little, my little tray um, is an off-task child. Um, the, the ch uh, he is just, uh, he's just a funny kid. And uh, so teachers are often telling me, it looks like he's up in the, like, he's not even paying attention. Then they ask him a question, and he's got the answer like that, because he's a booger in that regard. He, he tricks me. Uh, but anyway, he says he's an off-task kind of a person. So I created a little card that I taped to his desk. And I, I, like, you are on task when you are listening, when you are writing, when you are um, following, you're looking at the teacher. Um, I had to actually physically teach him how to pay attention, essentially. Um, see, these kids don't have problem solving skills. They struggle with problem. They, what comes naturally to the typical child? The typical child knows, oh, paying attention means looking at the teacher and talking and listening. The atypical child goes, yeah, I don't even know what that means. Mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. And we have to actually teach them how to do that. So cueing for attention is another great strategy. Easy to employ, too. I like slam. Okay, sometimes these kiddos, and honestly, I said yesterday that emotional behavior disorders in the public school is rising. Um, <clears throat> kids are coming with issues and these emotional behavior just I saw things in the public school when I worked there I was like wow I did not know an, a child could act like a demon and that it was like almost demonic possession is what I was seeing in the public school um, it is an issue and some of these kids are coming with major anger problems and they don't they can't take criticism well and we as teachers need to teach them how to Take criticism. Are they going to get criticized in school? Do they have to, you know, get an F sometimes, or they have to get things marked wrong? And sometimes they'll just blurt out or blow up. So we teach them how to accept and understand feedback, essentially. Um, the slam is stop what you're doing, look whomever it is in the eye, ask them to clarify, and then make an appropriate response. You know, sometimes with friends, don't, you probably have this issue on the playground. They blow up. And you're, okay, let's learn slam. What does slam say? Stop, look, ask, and say something. Make an appropriate response. So, like I said, the typical child, would it comes to them naturally to do that. Sometimes these little kids that have these EBD problems or learning disabilities, they need to actually physically be taught how to do that. Teacher, this is a good strategy that you should be doing every day. You need to chunk your material down, okay? Um, listen, uh, in case you didn't know, and if you didn't have educational psychology when you were in college, um, the human brain, the working memory, that is your conscious mind. Everything that you know is happening at this moment is, is it happening, you're listening to me, is happening in your working memory. Your working memory can hold only five to seven, uh, five to nine pieces of information at one time. So therefore, when we give voluminous amounts of words to children, they remember about nine of them. So we chunk it down. We put it in little chunks. I'm not saying only give them nine words, but I'm saying we chunk it, maybe a bullet point here, a bullet point here, and then we take a little break. And we come back, a bullet point here, and so on and so forth. You have got to learn to chunk your material down or else you're going to overload your kids. They're working, their processing cannot handle um, the, the amount sometimes that we give them. So you could do, um, you could do little, little groups. So rather than giving a whole lecture on the science unit, you could say, okay, we're going to break up into groups. You guys are going to read this page. You're going to read this page. You're going to read this page. You're going to read this page. We'll come back together. So all, each group is only getting so much information at one time. Just another really good way, um, and I could talk more about that, but I need to keep on moving. Another strategy, I love the Venn diagrams, okay? Showing them relationships, essentially. Uh, highlight similarities between things, sometimes they don't see that naturally. And so if you can give them a visual representation of what's, you know, so, um, you know, if you were doing, okay, what are the differences between cats and dogs? So we have cats over here, we have dogs over here, we have a circle in the middle, okay? Well, cats have, um, cats meow and dogs bark, okay? And in the middle, they have four legs, they have ears, they have tails, they're animals. Those kinds of, sometimes then visually representing that information helps it to click in their little brains, okay? 
Um, another strategy, I love the vocab concept map. I love this. Sometimes kids struggle with vocab and memorizing what a word means because they struggle with words because maybe they're dyslexic or they have a reading disability of some sort. Um, so when you are uh, doing uh, vocab, if you take, you put, it's kind of like a Venn diagram idea. You put a word in a box or a circle or something in the middle and you start concepting, visually mapping off of that word to teach them what that word means, okay? For example, if I were to say the word Thanksgiving, let's say the Thanksgiving was the vocab word of the week and that's my word in the middle. You start shouting out, what comes to your mind when you think of Thanksgiving? Turkey, Turkey. family, family. crescent rolls, Pres what? Crescent rolls. <laughs> football, Gravy. pumpkin pie, Black Friday, cranberry sauce, whatever. Okay, that's kind of the vocab. It teaches them, it helps them to look at things from a whole perspective, a whole perspective. Because some of these kiddos really struggle with memory and trying to ask them to memorize a definition, they're like, wait a minute, what? Mm -hmm. But if you give them a concept map and they're going, oh, oh, I see that. Okay, again, visual, visual, visual. I oh, sorry, I keep forgetting to put, this is what, okay. I had a clicker, but the person who used the clicker before kept the little clicker thing in their computer, and so I don't, um, yeah, I wasn't able to use it. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, partner talk. Partner the student, uh, this is, uh, you know, think, pair, share would be another way of saying this one, okay? Love think, pair, share. I use think, pair, share at the university level. The kids love it. They love it, they love getting together, and I'll say, okay, I want you to, I'll put it up on the board, and I'll say, okay, split up, I want you to talk to each other, I, and I walk around, because if they are messing around, they're in trouble with me, okay? And I don't mess around with that, and they know it now. <laughs> they, they know this is work time, y'all, and uh, you make sure, teacher, you're in charge, don't you let those teachers run you, you are in charge of that classroom, and you direct that time. So that means when, you th when they're in think, pair, share, or partner talk, that is not free time for you, my friend. I'm sorry, I know you're busy, it's just not. It can't be, you've got to be monitoring that. Um, but they get together, they talk, and they, they discuss, they, you know, they ask each other questions and then they share with the class. Um, it's a great tool. It gets them engaged in the material. You know, when you sit and, you know, I mean, you think about you. You guys have been at this conference for a couple days and you are hearing people talk, and I, I'm really sorry. You know, and it's the last one, and you're just like, oh, all this information. And some of you are like, oh, kill me now, okay? Well, think about your kids. They do this on a day-in and day-out basis. So if we can mix it up for them, get them engaged into the material, yes? So I'm elementary level, and something that, I, that you've given me the idea about with what you're just saying now is, uh, something I've noticed in my class as well, there's particular subjects which they don't like and there are particular subjects which they do like. Yes. My kids like Bible. So something I've decided this weekend, I'm going to move Bible to the end of the day when they're supposed to be switching off. Great. If they have a favorite subject, they're more likely to wake up. That's so my true. I hate reading, so I'm going to move that to the start of the day. That's right, when they're, they're fresh. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yes, moving, adjusting your schedule so that your kids are fresh for the hardest subjects or the things that they hate, the, you know. Maybe it's math. Okay, sorry, Heidi. But uh, maybe it's math and put math at the beginning of the day so they're fresh and they're ready to go. Man, if, you put, if they hate math and it's hard for them, you put math at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, guess what they're not going to do? Learn. Okay? Uh, so be careful with that. Yeah. Another strategy I like is which one doesn't belong? Try, again, this is a vocabulary test uh, where you, um, you create a list of four to three to four words or whatever, and uh, you try to uh, get the students to determine which one doesn't belong in this group. So it's a vocab thing, because sometimes, like I said, sometimes kids just don't get vocab. So you create a list and say, okay, one of these words doesn't belong with this vocab word. What is it? And it, again, it's that whole looking at the thing wholly, okay? I love sight word bingo. I like bingo, period. I, I, you know, um, my, my family's not saved, and I grew up in the bingo halls with my grandmother. I went to, I went to the fire halls every week, um, and, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe that's bad, but I did. Um, and, you know, the kids love bingo. It's a game they love to play. I, I used to play in Spanish. I call it tango. Um, I have it. That's what tango means. And, uh, and we loved it. Create a bingo game with sight words or with math what, facts or whatever. You fill in the blank. It could be anything. And get the automaticity. What is automaticity? 
they don't even have to think about it. They can just, one plus one, two. Four, four times four, 16. That's automaticity. And you do want your kids automatically being able to shoot off some of those things. So create a game to get them to do that, okay? Reading performance, I am an actress. Um, I, I love theater. Theater is like one of my passions. My husband and I, um, I do a lot of directing over at Maranatha. Absolutely love theater. So anytime I can get kids to perform, you know what? You got, you've got a story, get them to act it out. If they're struggling with comprehension, man, there's something about getting, putting on a costume or putting on a little hat and you know, acting it out that resonates with kids. They're engaged in the material. Again, the running theme is engaging. Engaging, engaging, engaging. I mentioned this in the last session. I love audiobooks. Audiobooks are a great tool. Audible.com is a great way to find them. And I'll give you a couple of other things at the end today. It tells you where you can find audio versions. But sometimes kids with learning disabilities, reading problems, if they have an audio version of it, they get it. They get it. So give them that option. Prep. Set them up, okay? Teach them how to find what you're, okay, if you say, okay, I want you to read the next five pages in your Heritage Studies book, okay, maybe they'll read it, but they won't get anything out of it, okay? Direct their reading. Give them a guide. Do something, a, a graphic organizer or something ahead of time. And along with that, I like the KWL. What you know, what you want to learn, and what you have learned, uh, so you set it up. Before you have a reading selection, say, okay, what do you know about seals? And they'll say, oh, they bark. Or, or, or. They're in the ocean. Okay. What do you want to know about them? Well, I want to know where they live. Okay. And then we finish the reading or we finish the teaching. What have you learned about them? It's a great activity for kids, to, again, to engage personally with the material. I like story maps. That's a graphic organizer teaching them how to find the characters, how to find the setting using a story map. Getting the gist. <laughs> um, I think sometimes kids with reading problems especially have a hard time pulling out the, with selective attention. It's like they can't pull out what's most important in the paragraph. And so, okay, teaching them how to get the gist, we call it. No, not, you know, get rid of the vocabulary. Okay, what was that all about? No, what was the gist? See how much better that is? They'll be like, oh yeah, the gist. All right, let's find the gist. So Kenton, teaching them, what is the gist behind this paragraph? Um, finding the main idea, isn't that the point? When you have them reading, you want them figuring it out. Listen, one of the main problems that I have with college students, they don't know how to read. And it's not because they have a disability, it's because they've not been taught how to pull the main ideas out of the paragraph. Brainstorm writing, great way to get them brainstorming. I think uh, kids, if you have a kids that have a hard time writing, draw pictures. Tell them to draw pictures of their story. And then you watch, they draw pictures, I'll bet you anything they could write it after that. Some kids, you know, it's just the connection there. Um, I love scope is another one that I really love. Um, it's a proofreading. Oh, kids and their proofreading skills, let me tell you. I, I just, my kids just turned into paper, and my college students, my freshmen, and I felt like wanted to melt reading, going, wow. Okay, scope is you teach them an acronym, spelling, capitalization, order of words, punctuation, and expression. Teaching them, you actually have to teach them how to do that. I love, um, another thing that college students struggle with, no, you gotta take note of this, high school teachers, is test taking skills. They don't know how to take tests. They melt. I'm, I am dealing with more kids with test anxiety than I have ever dealt with, and I've been in my job for six years now. Kids melting, they don't know how to take a test. So teaching them strategies of how to do that. Um, pirates will help you with that, okay? And then I'm not gonna go into that. This is one of my favorite strategies. Oh, wait a minute, let me do rap first, I forgot. Teaching students how to paraphrase their reading using rap, okay? That's a big word nowadays. Uh, rap, read the paragraph, then ask yourself what the question is, and then put it into your own words, rap. Read, ask, put, okay? Post-it notes. I love post-it notes, they're my best friend. It's how I keep my to-do list going. And um, what I tell kids, if you're reading a paragraph, you're reading a selection. You know, college students have like pages and pages of reading, and they get very overwhelmed very quickly with the amount of reading they have to do. So I tell them, okay, take a post-it note. 
you read a paragraph, write on that post-it note what, that, what is most important in that paragraph and put that post-it note over top of the paragraph. Read the next paragraph, so on. So when you come back to review, you're not looking at a verbosity of words, you're looking at post-it notes. And you've created an outline for yourself, frankly. Okay, it's a great strategy, great skill. Speak it. Listen, some kids just can't get it on paper. Teachers, get a technology in your classroom, get the speech to text. You can get Dragon Naturally Speaking for like 12 bucks on Amazon. Download it onto your classroom computer. Tell your parents to put it on their computers. They speak into the microphone and the Microsoft Word writes it for you. It's a great tool. You know, a lot of kids have a great ideas up here, but the thought of getting it here to here, they're going, ah. So give them that option. Yes, sir? I actually wrote my dissertation using that program. Did you really? That's a great program. My husband uses it for his, doc his, his dissertation. So um, speak it. Um, oh, I already, I already did that one. Sorry. I did that one. Give me five. Some of you might already do this. Uh, again, this is an attention thing. Give me five. Focus. Ignore distractions. Voice off. Eyes down. Five. OK? Give me five. So those are some strategies. Now, I want to tell you about some interventions that I would very much <laughs> encourage. What is an intervention, essentially? And I'm going to let you kind of look at that on the worksheet because I need to continue on here. But I wanted to show you some interventions that I feel like are, um, are good interventions that could be easily put into place in your school. If you have kids who are struggling with reading, Wilson. Uh, is a dyslexia-based program. It's based on the Orton-Gillingham approach uh, to teaching students with dyslexia. I highly recommend it. You have to be certified to do it, but um, the certification is easy to get. Edmark is another excellent reading program. Excellent. It's got a lot of, it uses a lot of visuals, a lot of pictures. Sound Partners, I've taught through Sound Partners myself. It's phonemic awareness, teaching them how to, uh, that, the A says ah, and the B says buh, that kind of a thing, using pictures. Fountas and Pinnell is a great leveled reading program. If you need a level to understand wh what level of reading your kids are at, I, would, I think the Fountas and Pinnell is the best one. Reading Recovery is a computer program. And then PALS is a, actually a school-wide peer uh, support program for reading um, that is easily implemented. And it could be done during a study hall time or even during reading time um, at the school. Some apps that I really like. Some of you might see some things on here that you have used. But Raz Kids is excellent. Excellent, excellent, excellent. I think you have to pay $1.99 or something for it. I don't know. It's, it's cheap. But it is, I, I highly recommend it. It's great for reading and writing, things like that. Bitsboard is another excellent, excellent app. Aesop's Quest is a game. They teach you reading, spelling, things like that with games. Starfall, same thing. Uh, math, very math-based. Gamequarium, you're going to find a lot of math games on there. And then Spelling City is a spelling app. Teachers, if you have problems, students with uh, spelling problems, this is a great app. You can put your own spelling list in here, and then they can practice on their home computer with your spelling list. It's a great, great, great app. Math programs that I highly, oh goodness, sorry, that I highly recommend for kids with struggling is ba basic picture math. Sometimes these kids, number sense for them is really off. They don't know that one equals one, so they have to see pictures of it. And basic picture math is an excellent math program. Dreambox is a computer program. Fast math is another computer math curriculum. Touch math is their touching math to get it. And then math you see is another curriculum program.